Audiobook Title Summoning America, 148-149, by Diardorito Zendi. This work belongs to Diardorito Zendi, Source Scribble Hub, and Wattpad.com. Chapter 148, The Land of the Free. Author Note. We will return to the GRA Valkan War with Chapter 150. Author Resources. For more comprehensive and current updates, please join my Discord server. Discord https colon slash slash discord dot gg slash ymbtbnw December 22nd, 1640 Cedar, Chrysiles The main hall of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was a grand space, designed to intimidate the neighboring nations. Today, it seemed to shrink under the weight of anticipation. At the end of the hall stood a door that led to Minister Tatchell's office, where a meeting was underway. After the introduction, we had formal discussions with the leader of the American delegation, Ambassador Anders. Liraz explained. We spoke about potential areas of cooperation but did not agree on anything conclusive yet. They'd invited us for a tour of their homeland, a chance to observe their culture, economy, and military might firsthand. They seemed quite eager to display their capabilities. I agreed to this proposal. I suggest we carefully select a team for this expedition. Not just diplomats, but also experts in magic, technology, and military tactics. Tatchell nodded, his mind turning over the implications of this invitation. This was an opportunity, no doubt, but it was also a potential pitfall. As Tatchell dismissed Liraz and prepared to bring this news to the Divine Chamber, he wondered about what sort of steps they would decide on taking. They would have to be very careful about how they approached this. Entering the Divine Chamber, he prepared to deliver the news to King Guj alongside the rest of the divine family and a cohort of advisors. From General Affairs Minister Wades to the Warrior King Minette. Your Divine Highness. Tatchell began, kneeling before the regal figure on the throne. He relayed the details of the report compiled by Ambassador Liraz, sparing no detail. From the awe-inspiring display of American technology and the vivid landscape of their vast lands, to the revelation of their formidable military prowess. Tatchell recounted every observation and deduction made by Commander Jailmark and Technician Elena. He explained how the Americans made a point to emphasize their desire for peace, but also their readiness for war. Considering the disparity in power, he stressed, it would be prudent to determine a policy by which we can coexist with these Americans, reaping off their trade rather than reaping the souls of our kin in battle. Guj digested the information, eyes gleaming with a mix of curiosity and caution. The details presented a clear picture. The Americans were a powerful entity, a civilization that could not be taken lightly. We must tread carefully. The Divine King finally said, We are dealing with an entity we do not fully understand, yet one that holds tremendous power. He paused, looking each of his advisors in the eye. We shall not bow down, nor will we provoke. Our next steps must be considered carefully, taking into account everything we have learned so far. I want to know more about these Americans, about their ways, and about their intentions. Arrange for a diplomatic party to attend this proposed tour. The officials present delved into discussion, a consensus gradually forming around Neith, the Divine Princess. Her youth and curiosity made her an ideal candidate to soak in the new experiences and insights this tour would provide. Her diplomatic tendencies would also serve her well in the gentle dance of interactions with the Americans. Divine Princess Tatchell addressed Neath directly, you have always shown wisdom beyond your years. It would be an honor if you would represent us in this critical task. Neath, startled at first by the proposition, considered it carefully. The responsibility was immense. Still, she felt an exciting thrill at the prospect. It was a chance to be a part of something groundbreaking, something that would reshape their understanding of the world. With a determined nod, she accepted. I am honored by your faith in me and will endeavor to represent Chrysalis to the best of my abilities. With Neith selected as the main representative and Liraz sent to support her, the council now had to finalize the delegation's other members. It was critical to select a diverse set of specialists with a broad range of knowledge and expertise to properly determine what the Americans exactly were. I propose Scholar Ilsa be added to the delegation, Tatchell suggested. Her understanding of our own economics is unparalleled and her perspective will be crucial in dissecting the intricacies of the American economy, as well as determining how a relationship with these Americans can benefit us. The Divine King, with a thoughtful expression, agreed. An excellent point, Tatchell. Her insights will indeed be valuable. 
The discussion moved on to the technological aspects of the United States, something that the initial expedition noted to be bereft of the arcane, but otherwise knew little about. Tettle, the Grand Mage, spoke up. Given the strange power that the New World Development Fleet observed, I myself shall determine what these Americans have in store for us. I also request the presence of magical technician Elena, who had already experienced American technology firsthand. Request granted. Giyuj nodded. Minette was the next to speak, hoping to wedge some of his influence into the selection. The proposed members, aside from Elena, whom he did not know, were all staunch opponents of his imperialist policies. Thus, he proposed the inclusion of a group of his top subordinates. We should include Commander Seedlin, Divine Knight Miro, and Lieutenant Dalcino. Commander Seedlin's track record is second to mine, and Lieutenant Declino's position as ace marksman has its own merits. Divine Knight Miro was not as exceptional as the other two, but he was fervently loyal to Minette. I believe these men and their skills will be valuable assets in assessing the Americans' military capabilities. Their suggestions were met with agreement, and the delegation's members were confirmed. However, one more aspect remained to be considered, their own impressions and interactions with American society and culture. Understanding the nuances of American culture would provide a unique perspective, and depth to their assessments. After considering a few names, the council agreed on Soren, a social researcher known for his analytical prowess and intuitive understanding of social cultures. Having worked on the complex governing system that maintains stability within their vassal nations, his inclusion would help in understanding, and potential taking advantage of, the societal and cultural aspects of American civilization. By the end of the discussion, a delegation representing a broad spectrum of Chrysalian expertise had been formed. Neith, Liraz, Ilsa, Tettle, Elena, Seedlin, Miro, Dalcino, and Sorin. The team was thus assembled and given their mission to bring back a comprehensive understanding of the Americans. December 24, 1640. Kingdom of Silkark. With a soft rumble, the airship settled down, the hum of its magical engines dissipating as the landing gear made contact with the artificial stone below. As Princess Neith and her delegation stepped out of the airship, they were warmly greeted by a welcoming party led by a man in a sharp suit. Your Highness, Princess Neith, he said, bowing slightly. I am Ambassador Anders and I extend to you the warmest welcome on behalf of the United States. This, he gestured to the aircraft behind him, is the jet that we'll be flying on. I assure you that your journey will be comfortable and safe. Ambassador Anders guided them inside the plane, which was extraordinarily spacious. The comfortable seats, tables, and classy interior design spoke volumes about the care with which the Americans treated their guests. Following the instructions of the crew, Neith and the other Chrysalians secured themselves for takeoff. The plane's powerful ascent proved yet another marvel. It was very different from the smooth liftoff that she was accustomed to on airships. The Americans' method of flight seemed as if they were fighting against the laws of nature to reach the skies. What surprised her most was the speed of the jet, the acceleration of which far outstripped a standard airships. Princess Neith gazed out of the window, awestruck as Silkark receded beneath them and the surrounding ocean came into view. The hum of the airplane engines became a soothing backdrop as the journey went on. Comfortably seated, they began discussing their mission with Liraz bringing the delegation up to date on the information they had so far on the Americans. I never thought I'd see the day when I'd see such a contraption, much less be inside of it. Ilsa murmured, her hand brushing against the plush fabric of her seat. The concept of these machines, the reliance on them instead of magic, it's beyond intriguing. I can't help but wonder how it shapes their economy. Seedlin, always the tactful observer, nodded his agreement from his position by the window. Looking out, he sipped on a can of Coca-Cola, savoring the unusual taste. They have a peculiar relationship with these machines. We're born with magic, it's part of our essence. For them, it's different. They create machines to mimic magic. Moreau interjected, his voice carrying an undercurrent of derision. Our magic is a divine gift, but theirs? Lifeless devices conjured by man. His statement hung in the air until it was countered by Neetha's reasoning. We are here to learn and to understand. To judge prematurely would be an error. This plane is one such example. A machine devoid of any magical essence, yet it outstrips our finest skyships in speed and altitude. Elena added to Neetha's words. And the purpose of their technology extends beyond mere comfort 
and convenience. Envision armadas of these planes, fitted with cannons and bombs instead of luxurious seats. Seedlin agreed, the lines on his weathered face deepening in thought. Indeed, the face of warfare would be forever altered. Their planes may not be able to carry as many cannons as ours, but that is no matter if our cannons can't even land a single strike on their speedy planes. Miro, shifting uneasily in his seat, voiced his disagreement. His warrior's pride was visibly ruffled by their discussion. That goes for them as well. With what puny cannons they can fit onto a craft such as this, it would be unlikely they could breach our shields. Undeterred by Miro's interjection, Elena continued. Beyond warfare, the implications of their technology, coupled with their populace, it could instigate an industrial revolution surpassing our own. Their productivity, their efficiency. Ilsa joined in once more, the topic now touching her realm of expertise. I concur. The economic ramifications are indeed significant. But it surpasses merely an industrial revolution. We could be witnessing the precursors of a societal revolution, if the video seen by Lady Liraz holds any truth. The group sociologist Soren couldn't agree more with Ilsa's statement. Imagine the realms of labor this kind of technology could potentially replace. He said. Imagine the change it would bring to trade and communication, to the ordinary course of life itself. Dalsino, who had thus far been silent, finally spoke. His gaze was fixed on the window, observing the clouds was by. Hi, it's not just about the war machines and workforces, it's about the lives of us common folk. The average man in Chrysalis would have never dreamt of such speed, such convenience. I am surprised they have airships dedicated for civilian travel only. This fact was most unsettling. Although their guesses on the American military were limited by Liraz's notes on the American video, the fact that air travel was not exclusive to the military spoke volumes. If planes were numerous enough to be used by the people, then they likely had an unfathomable amount fielded by their military. According to Liraz, thousands upon thousands of bomber planes were constantly used in battle almost a century ago, leveling cities with thousands of tons of bombs. They could only shudder at how much more power the Americans developed over the past 80 years. Tettle, the Grand Mage, chimed in. Yet let us not forget the essence of our people. We are bound by the arcane, this divine magic that pulses within our land and our beings. This mechanical revolution could potentially estrange us from our roots. Tettle's statement prompted thoughtful silence from the delegation. The hum of the airplane engine was the only sound punctuating the quiet. Neath broke the silence. Tettle, you raise an important concern. Our roots, our bond with the arcane, it defines us. We are not looking to replace our roots, but to grow from them. We may benefit from mechanical knowledge, and we may benefit from a relationship with a wealthy nation of mechanists. The dialogue faded as the group returned to their individual thoughts. The plane started its descent, and soon the Chrysalians were greeted with their first glimpse of the American coastline, a land foreign yet fascinating. The sight elicited a collective gasp from the Chrysalians, with many pressing their faces against the plane's windows to get a better view. Elena's voice rang out above the excited murmurings. There it is, America. Everyone's eyes turned to the windows where, in the distance, they could make out the shimmering coastline of a vast land. The sight was made all the more breathtaking by the light of the setting sun, which bathed the landscape in warm hues. From the cockpit, Ambassador Anders introduced his guests over the plane's intercom. Welcome to the United States of America. Our first destination is the city of Miami, located in the state of Florida. It's a city known for its vibrant culture, stunning beaches, and incredible diversity, a true testament to the American spirit. As the plane continued its route to the airport, they could make out the details of the land below. There were sprawling suburbs and impressive skyscrapers. Veins of highways covering more land than all the roads of the Chrysalian homeland, and a patchwork of fields and forests. A variety of ships loitered about the coast, from container ships to antiquated sailing vessels to mysterious ships endowed in golden hues, which oddly resembled the design aesthetics of their single pal chimera. As the plane descended further, the group's anticipation grew. The bustling cityscape of Miami was now within view, stretching out as far as the eye could see. And then, with a soft thud, the plane touched down. The plane had safely delivered them to the mysterious land of America. The doors opened, letting in a gust of slightly warm, humid air that smelled like salt and flowers. With a final deep breath, the Chrysalian delegation walked down the steps and onto the tarmac. Miami, 
and the United States of America, awaited them. 14. The Home of the Brave. Next. Last time on Summoning America. The Parpaldian War, which occurred a year ago, was a conflict between the United States against the Parpaldian Empire. Complete and overwhelming U.S. victories on the battlefield led Chaos to orchestrate a peaceful coup, supported by the CIA, against Emperor Ludius in order to prevent the Parpaldian Empire from completely collapsing under mounting U.S. victories. His coup was successful and Chaos signed for peace with the U.S., resulting in Ludius's position being relegated to ceremonial only and the reformation of the Parpaldian Empire into the Parpaldian Republic, led by President Chaos. December 25th. 1640, Miami, Florida. Stepping onto the Miami International Airport tarmac, the Cresilians found themselves immersed in a wave of new sensory experiences. The Florida winter was a slightly humid, lukewarm embrace, rich with the salty tang of the ocean and the bloom's perfume that flourished in the subtropical climate. The ambient hum of the bustling airport, a place teeming with activity and urgency, held a foreign yet fascinating cadence compared to the tranquil silence above Cresilian cities. Around them, jumbo jets, large but not quite comparable in size to their elegant Cresilian airships, dotted the airport, humming with the power of earthly engineering. Princess Neath watched with a thoughtful gaze, an unspoken acknowledgement of the potential that these machines, and by extension, their creators held. The Diplomatic Security Service, DSS, had arranged a fleet of imposing, black SUVs for their escort. While vehicles were a common sight in Chrysalis, the rumble of combustion engines was a novel experience for the delegation accustomed to the gentle hum of arcane-powered transport. Even Divine Knight Miro, a traditionalist at heart, felt the walls of his prejudice crumble in the face of familiar technologies replicated by mechanical forces. The convoy smoothly exited the confines of the airport, navigating toward the freeway as they journeyed past Miami streets. As seen from the sky, the highway was enormous. It facilitated traffic at far greater scales than the streets back in Chrysalis. The sheer number of vehicles was an obvious testament to the city's population density and industrialized nature and caught the attention of the two scholars, Ilsa and Soren. Due to traffic congestion on the freeway, the convoy detoured through the upscale district of Brickhill. The Cresilians caught a glimpse of Miami Beach, its iconic white sands dotted with sunbathers under a canopy of colorful beach umbrellas. Palm trees dotted the streets, putting the Cresilians in awe of this exotic, never-before-seen flora. In the distance, opulent yachts shared the waves with a diverse array of vessels. Finally, the Conva reached their destination, a hotel overlooking the beach, identified as the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Key Biscayne by a driver. Its grandeur was a symbol of luxury, and its location provided the necessary security for such a prestigious delegation. As the Cresilians disembarked onto the Palm Fringe driveway, an air of anticipation hung about them. They were now at the epicenter of Miami, ready to explore all these Americans had to offer. After a restful night to recover from their journey, the Cresilians awoke to a sunny Friday morning on December 23rd, ready to explore Miami Beach. They journeyed down from their rooms, linking up with their guides from the State Department in the lobby. Despite it being an entirely different environment, the soft hum of activity in the hotel brought a sense of familiarity. They began their excursion with a walk along the South Beach. The sight of the Azure Sea lapping gently at the sun-drenched sands was familiar, yet captivating. Yet, more mesmerizing was the vibrant mix of Americans and Elysians lounging under the Miami sun. Elves with their slender forms and pointed ears as well as beast men boasting diverse arrays of animalistic traits, casually mingled with humans. This sight was a great shock to the Cresilians, previously known to them only through mythology and lore from their ancestors who had fled the central world to escape Noscarathus. Rampage. They walked past the Miami Beach boardwalk, catching glimpses of the opulent Art Deco hotels and the lively cafes, bursting with life and music. As they strolled along the bustling promenade, the Cresilians noticed the preparations for an upcoming cultural fair. From the fluttering banners and the temporary stalls, it was evident that the locals were enthusiastic about preserving and showcasing earthly culture. Amidst the blend of Elysian influences, Liraz had heard Anders claim that the United States was a transferred country, but dismissed that claim as a tall tale until now. Amid the high spirits and festivity, they couldn't help but notice the Christmas decorations. Palm trees were strung with twinkling lights, storefronts sparkled with tinsel and garlands, 
and oversized pine trees adorned plazas and lobbies, similar to the decorated tree in the hotel lobby. To Soren, these were fascinating insights into American culture and religion. To the others, the holiday spirit was infectious and uplifting. Towards the late afternoon, after spending the day exploring, the Cresselians finally settled down to rest by the beach, the cool sea breeze providing a welcome contrast to the warm sun overhead. Neith and Liraz remained by Ender's side, their gazes frequently moving between the lively beach scene and the alluring horizon, taking in the spectacle of American civilization. Amid the melange of beachgoers, a familiar figure caught Ambassador Ender's eye. He squinted against the sunlight, trying to discern the faces under the shade of a beach umbrella. His heart thumped in his chest as he recognized the two individuals, none other than President Chaos and his wife, Ryda. Is that? He murmured to himself, disbelief coating his voice. The two Propaldians glanced toward the Chrysalian group, their eyes meeting with Anders. The surprise on their faces was evident, but it quickly shifted into delight. Ambassador Anders? President Chaos called out, his voice carrying over the murmur of the beach. At his beckoning, Ambassador Anders looked at Neith and Liraz with a mixture of surprise and excitement. He was about to introduce the Chrysalians to some very significant figures indeed. President Chaos, Lady Ryda. Anders greeted with a nod of his head as he approached, the smile on his face warm and genuine. It's a pleasure to see you both here, as with you, Ambassador. Chaos replied, lifting the sunglasses off his face. We finally got the chance to go on vacation. I heard from Emperor Ludius and Rimmel that Miami was a good spot, Anders agreed. Excellent choice. Miami isn't as lively as it used to be, but that means we get the beaches all to ourselves, pretty much. He paused. Ah, uh, may I present Princess Neith and Ambassador Liraz from the distant land of the sacred kingdom of Great Chrysalis. Princess Neith, Ambassador Liraz, a pleasure. Chaos greeted them with a polite nod, his wife following suit. Ryda's eyes sparkled with curiosity as she studied the two Chrysalians. Likewise, Mr. President, Lady Ryda. Neith responded, offering a curtsy. Liraz merely bowed in acknowledgement. Ryda couldn't help but express her fascination. Chrysalis. I've never heard of it. An isolated nation, isn't it? Neith shared a glance with Liraz before nodding. Indeed, Lady Ryda. Our homeland is rather distant and isolated. We've only now had the chance to reconnect with the lands of our ancestors. It is a pleasant surprise knowing that these lands have not been scoured by demons. Refugees from the era of Nascarath? Chaos asked, an intrigued glint in his eyes. Neith nodded. You know, the Americans here actually defeated the demon king. Neitha's eyes widened in surprise as she turned to Anders. Is this true? Anders nodded. Indeed it is, your highness. He pulled out his phone conducted a quick Google search of Nascarath, and showed it to the princess. The group spent a few more moments exchanging cultural introductions, formalities and inquiries, before the Chrysalians finally excused themselves and returned back to the hotel. Left with the Parpaldians, the conversation drifted toward more casual topics. You know, Anders. Chaos began, a smile playing on his lips. They're finally setting up the internet in Asterint. Quite the development, don't you think? Oh, I can only imagine the excitement. Anders chuckled. Has it changed anything so far? It seems meme culture has taken root among us few who are lucky enough to have phones and computers. Some of it is kind of, S.U.S. Chaos grinned, stifling laughter. Anders broke into a smile, shaking his head. Man, I can't believe it. He said before finally bursting into laughter. After sharing a hearty chuckle with his old acquaintance, Chaos continued. Thanks to the internet, we've been able to stream the latest content from the United States. No more waiting for DVD shipments. Ryder chimed in. Oh? Anders raised an eyebrow. What stuff are you watching? Have you seen the latest about Manifest Fantasy? Our people are rather obsessed. Ah, uh, I can relate to that. Anders said, matching K.O.'s grin. It's a popular show back in the States too. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to catch up. Work's been busy. K.O.'s gave his condolences discussing other technological developments and popular culture instead. In the past year, the Propaldian Republic saw a lot of changes. With the integration of a modernized plumbing system and the installation of undersea cables representing the tip of the iceberg, the loss of income from their vassal states was a significant blow, but the new nation was recovering steadily under the watchful guidance of the United States government. 
Anders leaned back in his chair, his expression becoming more thoughtful. President Chaos, it's really quite something, seeing how far Propaldia has come. Ah, yes. Indeed, the changes have been monumental. Indeed. Ryder agreed, her eyes reflecting a quiet resilience. We had to take some drastic steps, and they were not always well received. But we knew it was necessary for the future of our nation. Chaos cleared his throat, leaning back in his chair as he gazed out at the water, the waves reflecting the deepening hues of the setting sun. You see, Anders. Chaos began, his voice noticeably deeper than before. Our transition from an empire to a constitutional republic was, and still is, a feat akin to moving a mountain. There is a deep-rooted system, a web of power, influence, and tradition that must be carefully unwoven and reshaped. The nobility, for one, presented a unique challenge. The old hierarchies were intricately entwined with our society's fabric. These were individuals used to privilege and power. Taking that away, it was no easy task. We had to strike a balance ensuring their continued importance and influence in the new society without letting them obstruct the path of progress. This meant transforming their roles from rulers to advisors, and from despots to democrats. Anders, you remember our discussions on Imperial Japan's post-World War II transition? Chaos inquired, referring back to a topic they had once delved into. Yeah, I do. Anders responded. The advisors your government sent guided us along that path. The emperor, once a divine figure, was made into a symbol of unity rather than an absolute ruler. We did the same, repurposing the nobility, retaining their prestige but limiting their power. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Remil was instrumental in getting this done. Anders smirked, surprised at Chaos's revelation. I guess people really do change, huh? Chaos smiled, savoring the brief moment of lightheartedness punctuating the tense air. But alas, it did not last. He continued, That was just the beginning. The vassal states were another hurdle. They hated us for what we did, and justifiably so. I'm just glad that your people were there as mediators. Anders gave an understanding nod. Then came the toughest part. Kao's voice became grim. Abolishing slavery. It wasn't just about the nobles. The slaves themselves, many we've had to send back home. Some didn't have a home to go back to, or no family left. Others were born and raised in captivity. Those who stayed behind in Parpaldia, they had no skills, no experience beyond servitude. But we had a plan. We set up schools and training centers under your people's guidance. It was a massive investment, one that is continuing to strain our coffers and my administration's relationship with the aristocracy. As for public sentiment, Chaos sighed. That is something that is beyond our direct control. We can only lead by example and hope that, in time, people will see the benefits of these changes. The general populace was initially fearful after seeing the bombs fall on Estherant. Some became resentful, upset. Their pride was damaged. But we had to make them understand that these changes were for the better. We launched extensive campaigns to educate the populace, to help them understand why these reforms were necessary. We organized town halls, manicom programs, and even used some of your nation's propaganda tactics. I still can't tell if the people are fearful of going against you Americans or if they're actually coming around. It's an ongoing process, and there is still much to do, but if we keep on this path. Kao's voice swelled with hope. If we stay patient and persistent, I believe we will build a better Propaldia. He looked to Anders, the glow of the setting sun on his face. I haven't had the chance to properly say this, but thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for guiding us along this new path. Don't worry about it. It was simply the right thing to do. Anders smiled. The road ahead will certainly be challenging, but you've got our support. The resilience and dedication of your people will certainly pay off in the long run. And of course, the United States will continue to stand by you in this journey. Anders paused, shifting slightly in his chair and letting a respectful silence settle over their conversation. Breaking the silence, Chaos ventured a cautious segue into their next topic. Speaking of challenges, he began, a change in his tone indicating a shift in conversation. I've noticed increased activity in your bases in the region. Could this be related to Giare Valka's empire? Indeed it is, indeed it is, Anders said. Chaos nodded. I see. It's all over the news after all. The Americans finally joining the war to help the Muins and Mauritials. From what I've seen on MNN and your news companies, the Giare Valkans seem to be giving the EDI quite the challenge. 
if even the Mauritials have abandoned their haughtiness, ha, huh? well that's how you know it's gotten bad. Anders chuckled at this, shaking his head slightly. Yeah, they're not particularly fond of admitting it, but it's true. Without our intervention, the world might be too badly bruised, too fragile to stand against the Ravernals. K.O. sipped his drink, the golden glow on the horizon starting to recede. How, even the Americans believe their prophesied return? Must be true after all. Yeah, we're hoping to put an end to this war as quickly as possible. If we're lucky, we'll be done within a year or two. Anders speculated. I wouldn't be surprised. Ryda commented. I almost feel pity for the Giari Valkans. K.O. smiled. Indeed, I can imagine. A single naval battle was all it took to flip Arde, Madel, and the others. But your people got lucky, having friends like us in Parpaldia's upper echelons. These Giari Valkans. Can your nation manage to replicate such success? Anders shrugged. I truly don't know. I doubt that the Giari Valkans would be stubborn enough to keep fighting after losing half their ships and planes. But either way, I'm sure my government will figure out a quick end to the war. We won't back down in the face of adversity. After all, we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. 11. 